Well, I'm going to start with a question I've always wanted to ask another human being, and I think you're the only person I can ask uh, it. All right. What's it like hammering a sword into your own foot? It'll sure fuck a nasty hole in your marrow, mate. We'll get the old ball rolling, eh? Well, that's um, a dim and distant memory. I mean, the, the hard part of that was being the guy who was hanging down the cliff because it was just a film where we had no sophistication and no professional techniques. It was, it was amateur, so if I wanted to hang upside down over a sheer cliff with a rope tied around my ankle, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> I, it was a bit freaky because I spent so long upside down that eventually um, when I you know, had got what, the scene, I couldn't feel my foot for quite a few weeks. It was like somehow I'd sort of managed to <laughs> crush the nerve and it, it, it completely deadened my foot for quite a long time, but it, did, it eventually came back again. Can we agree that Edgar Wright nicked that fence gag off you and then he cast you in Hot Fuzz as a kind of a thank you? With uh, what, what fence gag was Because you do a great tumble over a fence. I, I, I vaguely remember this. I haven't seen Bad Taste for a long time. I try to do a cool jump, do I? But I buggered up completely. That's correct. That's right. I vaguely remember that now. And did he do something? He did something like that, did he? I'm taking a shortcut before. Well, all of those Canetto trilogy movies yeah. have this fence gap. Oh, stolen, stolen. 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 I mean, it's as it really anyone need to even ask. Yeah, great point. And I love seeing you with Santa every time <laughs> I watch Hot Fuzz. It's like a little surprise treat. I don't think you, I think anyone knows it's me. When wounded by a man dressed as Father Christmas. That was the role I was born to play, Psycho <laughs> Santa. Now, before we get onto that Lord of the Rings thing, <laughs> can we talk about King Kong? What in God's name was that? <laughs> Now, with the King Kong film, obviously you yeah. love the original. It screams off the mm. screen. Mm. But I, I got the feeling in seeing your cameo in that movie, that would be enough for oh, me. the plane, that's right. Got it. I was, I was trying, to, trying to, re to remember what my cameo was. That's right, yes. Yep, no, sure. It just makes me think that's, that's a reason enough to do the movie because to be the guy or one of the guys in the biplanes. And, and I had Rick Baker flying the plane who played King Kong in the Dino film in 76. Yeah. So. So he wanted to exercise a few demons out of his spirit, so the fact that the two of us are doing it was great. Such a treat. I know. You know, no, that, that is the ultimate cameo. That's, and, and, I, and I did that cameo because it was a cameo that the original directors of the 1933 King Kong had done, that exact cameo. So it was like it wasn't even my choice. It had to, had to, had to happen. And should the sky be filled with fire and smoke? Keep watching over during suns. I'm going to ask you, um, as we dig into Lord of the Rings, Ed Sheeran was on Radio 1 maybe a year ago or so, mm -hmm. and he said the most amazing story about you. And he mm -hmm. said that during his gap year, he went to see you in New Zealand. Yep. And, and just tell me if this is BS or not. That yep. You strapped him to the front of a World War I plane and flew him round an airport area. Peter Jackson, the guy that does the Lord of the Rings films, uh, he collects World War pla One planes, um, and he strapped me to the front of one of them, standing up, and then flew me around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that entirely yeah, yeah, true? Yeah, yeah. Strap him in sounds like some sort of bondage moment. <laughs> I mean, I've got a, a bunch of First World War planes, mm -hmm. and he he was staying with us, and um, I said, "Do you want to go for a flight?" And he said, "Yeah." And we stuck him in a particularly scary-looking plane. It's called an FE two B. <laughs> which has a propeller at the back and he's pilots just put in front of the engine then the gunner which is what who, who had <laughs> position i mean he was in the front of the of this plane and there's nothing else to be seen it's just like and also um it was because it's an authentic first world war plane there's no seat belts there's no seat he had to sit, sit on the floor and then you know if he stood up if the plane had bounced he could have been sort of over the edge but yeah. you'd have broken a lot of hearts yeah mm -hmm. and i've broken a lot of his bones as well it's some form of elvish. I can't read it. There are few who can. The language is that of Mordor, which I will not utter here. And this is a big question, yeah. but do you have a favourite shot in the Lord of the Rings films? I suppose it's not a shot, though, is it? I mean, I like the sequence in Moria in the first one, they're going through Moria. I think just for some reason, the, the beginning to the end of that, so about tw 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Let us hope that our presence may go unnoticed. Had a sort of such a sort of a... It was a shape in the pattern of it and end up in Bannon's tomb and the 
goblins appear in the Balrog and over the bridge. It just had a sort of perfect, it could have been almost a little fantasy film unto itself. You know, it had a sort of perfect beginning, middle and end yeah. as, a, as a sequence, which I, so I really quite like that sequence. You shall not pass! That is, and oh, well, actually a favourite shot. Yeah, I, I think of one now. One that I'm particularly proud of because I hate spiders and the in the opening shot of Shelob when Frodo's thinking he's hearing something and the camera kind of cranes down and you realise that Shelob is just quietly crawling above. That's probably that's probably would be a favourite shot. Bilbo Baggins, allow me to introduce the leader of our company, Sorin Oakenshield. So this is the Hobbit. Jumping to the Hobbit. Yeah. I want to say that there is no justice for Basket Man, and Basket Man should have had an appearance. And I love that he does crop up. <laughs> yeah, am I, am I in the extended cut? Did I put myself back in this? I, I can't. I can't remember. Am I, in the, uh, I don't think you're in the extended cut. It was never to be seen again. Yeah, it's his thing. And it was a bit like the um, ba the beacon scene in the um, Return of the King. Oh. When, when they light the beacons mm -hmm. and the, on the mountains, and you see the aerial shot we did of the hit. That was a real, real beacon with no, no CG. It was a bloody thing of pile of bloody wood we put on, on a, a mountaintop somewhere with a little stone hut. And the guy comes out, sees the beacon miles away, and he rushes forward and lights it. And I think, well, how, how long has this guy been waiting? And is this the first time in his life? Is this, is, and, his, and, and is his father and his grandfather <laughs> were waiting? One day, my lad, you're the beacon, and you know we may go through our whole lives without ever having to light them. But you've got to be ready, and Finally! don't let them, and don't let the matches go wet. You know, it's um that, that does make me laugh. That That's sort a of stuff. great thought. Yeah. And the last thing on that is that uh, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit is that every time I chomp into a carrot, I think yep. of you. Yeah, no, well, that's, that's good. It's the way you do it, man. I mean, I found that carrot in the, in the, in the mud. <laughs> I had them give me a pipe, you know, I thought it would be pretty, I'm going to be smoking a pipe like a Tolkien character. And, and I felt so bloody sick and coughing with it because I don't normally smoke. So <laughs> the, the first couple of takes, I was just, <coughs> I just felt stupid. So I, I looked around, what else can I do? And there was actually in the mud on the side of the road, there was a, there was a, there was a carrot, carrot sort of wiped, wiped off the mud and, 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 and did that from, uh, from take three onwards. Let's jump to Mortal Engines. Now I've read the book and yeah. as soon as I heard you'd optioned this story, mm. I read the book and mm -hmm. I was giddy to see it. And mm. I, and I want to tell you something which maybe isn't the point of the film, but I, I found myself being almost proud of London because it looks so... Imperial. It, yeah, I guess that's me, yeah, well, you, you were going to say impressive. Right? Impressive, yeah. I was going to say imperial. What is that? That is London. It's the two giant lions. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going, oh, yeah, good for London. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, London's got every right to be, to be proud of itself. I mean, this is a world in which traction cities have been going for a long time. And, you know, you know in, our, in the story, it's like, this mm. is not new. This is a Millennium. Way of, the way of life for hundreds of years. And there's a lot of other, there's German towns, there's French towns, there's, there's Russian. I mean, they're all out there. And it's like London's got every right to be big and proud. Yeah. It's a sci-fi, it's post-apocalyptic. There's a lot of detail and colour here. Mm. Was that your biggest fear? Like, I need to get this world right for an, in order for it to work? What we consciously wanted to do was to not be dystopian or post-apocalyptic, but to be post-dystopian, yes. post-post-apocalyptic. Strange to think this is what it looked like. 21st century. Yep. In this story in Philip Reeves' books, I mean, that period did actually happen. Mm. You know, it's not in our film, but, but then what's happened in the subsequent, you know, couple of thousand years is society has built itself back up again. And it's just built itself back up in a way that's not quite the same as today because today's world has got, had been blitzed. This is what I wanted to show you. Yeah. So they find bits of London lying around, find St Paul's in, in 45 pieces. And the, the concept of a, being a mobile world of, of municipal Darwinism, which is a philosophy they, they live by, which is big cities, small cities, mm -hmm. that, that is now the way that they choose to live. But it's still, well, you wanted to make it still a colourful mm -hmm. world, the costume, there's still shops, there's theatres, there's, there's pubs, very importantly. It wouldn't be my ideal location to live, but it did look good. Thank you again, Peter. Right, thank you so much. a pleasure. Lovely. Thanks for watching. If you like that, then do watch these videos or you can listen to my podcast called Radio One Screen Time. Oh, and do not forget to hit that subscribe button. You can now get more Radio One in your life by downloading the BBC Sounds app or the BBC iPlayer app. Search for full-length versions of these interviews by typing in Movies with Ali Plum.